Um, so I guess just to begin, uh, based on um, sort of previous classifications, this would be a very player-centric uh, presentation. Um, also a bit narcissistic because it's my player experience, um, <laughs> so you'll have to kind of forgive that, I suppose. Um, so for those of you that haven't heard of Dragon Age Origins before um, or aren't familiar with it, it's a fantasy role-playing game that was developed by BioWare and released in 2009. Um, I'm just going to refer to it as DAO for short because it gets really long <laughs> to keep repeating it. Um, so, and it's often noted as a video game that incorporates ethical dilemmas, which means it sort of asks its players to make uh, tough choices at certain points in the game. Um, I think less often considered are the variety of ethical frameworks represented by the protagonist companions, who are allied characters that accompany the player's character throughout the game. Um, so my analysis of the conversations that occur between uh, characters during gameplay uh, suggests that these companions, with the possible exception of the dog, for anyone that's <laughs> familiar with the dog, uh, primarily upholds one of three strategies within normative ethics, um, including consequentialism, deontology, and virtue ethics. Um, so these companions and their diverse perspectives, I would say, produce a sort of multiplicity of voices, and uh, their variable influence on the player's conception of his or her character uh, led me to consider uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, sorry for the bad pronunciation, uh, his concept of the dialogical self. Uh, so while previous treatments of ethics in video games have often tended to focus on the development and activity of players and their communities, or on the design of ethical dilemmas, uh, Bakhtin's theories, I think, draw attention to the important role of in-game dialogue and the player's, relation, uh, player's dynamic relations with the other. Uh, so to begin, oh, okay, that's the title page. Uh, I'm going to refer to Bakhtin's description of the polyphonic novel from Problems of Dostoevsky's Poetics, um, which he says is characterized by, quote, the plurality of independent and unmerged voices and consciousnesses. Uh, so tied to his conception of dialogue, which incorporates spoken conversation as well as internal dialogue, uh, and can be understood most broadly, as, this, as the setting up of relations between the self and the other. Um, so while I don't want to obscure the differences between video games and the literary genre of the novel, um, or really get into that debate right now, uh, Michael Holquist suggests that as a central idea in what he calls the philosophy of dialogism, novelness uh, describes, quote, a form of knowledge that can most powerfully put different orders of experience each of whose language claims authority on its basis to exclude others into dialogue with each other. Uh, Bakhtin positions the polyphonic novel as a powerful instance of novelness. He also argues that, quote, dialogical relationships constitute a much more far-reaching phenomenon than merely the relationships between speeches in a literary composition. They are an almost universal phenomenon which permeates all human speech and all relationships and manifestations of human life. Bakhtin's fundamental argument, according to Holquist, is that the self must always exist in relation to the other. And I find personally that his notion of selfhood was particularly helpful in exploring the complex relationship between the player, the player character, and the companions in DAO. Um, so while my main focus will be on the ethical perspectives of the companions and the associated approval rating system, uh, I'll also briefly explore how these elements relate to other character types. And uh, I hate to bring this up now, but the notion of co-authorship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll be more specific about it, though. You'll see. <laughs> um, so DAO incorporates uh, many of the conventional features uh, commonly associated with computer role-playing games, to go back to uh, uh, Andreas's notion of genre, uh, including a customizable player character, a complex fantasy setting and combat system, and a party of companions. Companions are game char characters that accompany the player's character uh, throughout the game. Although they can be controlled during combat and exploration, they have their own personalities and will often voice their opinions during dialogue sequences. Often these opinions are tied to approval ratings, numbers that represent the extent to which a companion approves or disapproves of a decision. In DAO, each of the nine companions has a separate approval rating, 
which can increase or decrease independently, depending on which of the available dialogue options the player selects. This could occur when the player's character is talking directly to that companion, as well as when the PC or player character is in dialogue with the others. On a fictional level, increasing a companion's approval rating improves the relationship with the player's character, also known as the warden, eventually leading to a close friendship or romance, while decreasing the approval rating can lead to animosity and eventually betrayal or abandonment. On a ludic level, increasing uh, the approval rating unlocks new quests and abilities, allowing the player to access new game content and improving their capacity to defeat enemies in the game. Losing a companion, on the other hand, is equivalent in some ways to a loss of resources. It's strategically advantageous, therefore, to increase the approval rating of all companions, regardless of whether or not the player agrees with their differing and often contradictory ethical perspectives. While approval ratings can be effective in adding weight to a decision, they may not be reliable markers of a player's ethical decision-making if players opt to, quote, game the system. Uh, game mechanics such as multiple save slots, the four-member party system, and gift giving all provide ways of avoiding or mitigating negative, negative approval ratings and are particularly successful when combined with online guides. Multiple save slots allow players to repeatedly run through dialogue sequences until they achieve the best outcome. Online guides such as Dragon Age Wiki can also instruct players on which options to choose in advance. DAO allows players to travel with a maximum of three companions in their party, and by carefully selecting who was in the party and when, players can ensure that whatever decision they choose to make will be met with approval, or at least will not be met with disapproval. If all else fails, players can always give the unhappy individual a gift, which will boost their approval rating from one to 10 points. Oh, there you go. Uh, the companions are arguably the most fully developed characters in the game, with the possible exception of the warden, and most resemble Bakhtin's notion of the hero as, quote, ideologically authoritative and independent, a full-valued, full-fledged carrier of his or her own private world. Notice I said most, I don't, I'm not convinced that they really do. <laughs> um, however, not all voices in DAO are equal or full-valued. In terms of character development and potential forms of interactions, some character types clearly dominate over others. Um, the four major types I found included named non-player characters or NPCs, generic NPCs, player characters, and companions. Named NPCs have individual names and generally serve as quest givers, uh, informers, and enemy bosses, while generic NPCs are identified with blanket titles such as elf woman, uh, bandit, or genlock. Uh, of this last group, I find the Darkspawn are the most interesting from my perspective. The Darkspawn are introduced as grotesque monsters that uh, kill indiscriminately and corrupt anything they encounter with something known as the taint. Frequently referred to as evil, soulless creatures by other characters, the Darkspawn are rendered as voiceless objects, and they're thus subject to what Bakhtin refers to as finalizing secondhand definitions placing them firmly at one end of a binary opposition. In DAO, there are no opportunities for interacting with the Darkspawn, except as finalized, alienated objects that exist only to be destroyed. Although the player character is often seen as supporting the highest level of identification, Adrian Shaw and a number of others have argued that the relationships players have with that character vary substantially depending on the game, the context, the moment, the player, wide variety of factors. Uh, in DAO, the player character cr uh, creates, sorry, the player creates the warden during a player creation stage at the beginning of the game. Though players can choose one of six origin stories, which determine their character's socioeconomic background and other factors, the warden does not have a preset personality. Aside from the occasional fight, or shout during a fight, the warden never speaks out loud and during conversations, her back is usually turned to the camera. Expressionless and voiceless, the warden must be co-authored by the player in order to become, uh, or to have and become a character in addition to her capacity as an object or tool. Sorry. Holquist's interpretation of Bakhtinian theory describes authorship not just as the process of creating an other, 
but also as the process of creating the self. In Holquist's words, in order, in order to see ourselves, we must appropriate the vision of others. Only this will let me be an object for my own perception. I see myself as I conceive others might see it. In other words, I author myself. The act of creating the self is not free. We must create ourselves, for the self is not given to any one of us. This lack of choice extends to the materials available for creation, for they are always provided by the other. So this idea of creating ourselves from the outside, um, for me anyway, had certain parallels with the process of creating the warden as both self and other. Um, the site of agency for a developing character in the game, as well as for myself. So, just move on here. Sorry, that's my definition of character that I forgot to put up earlier. <laughs> Um, although the companions could also be controlled during combat and exploration, and are thus a site of agency in a way, they have a name, a personality, and most importantly, a voice that's not my voice. And these elements make their otherness more apparent. As others, they're also essential in the ongoing process of building the warden's character. Every time the warden interacts with these characters, relations of difference and sameness are produced. Sorry. You can tell I'm nervous. <laughs> uh, and when they describe their opinions of the warden, they help to shape the player's conception of that self slash other. When Wynne says, you are a great warden, it should inform your every action, your every decision. The player is made aware that this is, or should be, an important part of the warden's identity, at least as is conceived by others. Such statements, while often expressed as an objective fact, for example, you are a woman, that is actually a quote, are less passive observations than constructive events in which the companions and the players co-author the warden. Ivana Markova states that co-authorship demands evaluation of the other, struggle with the other, and judgment of the message of the other. Formulated in this way, co-authorship implies tension and the clashing of ideas, as well as consensus. Tension is certainly evident in the different ethical perspectives and conflicting personalities of the companions. For example, there's a strong contrast between Wynne's altruistic desire to help others and Morgan's ethical egoism, which is reinforced to some extent by the differences in their uh, appearance, voice, and general behavior. Despite the fact that both are mages or magic users, Wynne plays the role of the benevolent fairy godmother, while Morgan is identified as a witch. While this produces a rather interesting value statement in regards to the relative morality of these two perspectives, these references to archetypal characters are misleading in their two-dimensionality. Morgan's stories about her childhood, for example, suggest that her cold practicality is closely tied to her unusual upbringing and isolation from the rest of society. Each of the companions, in fact, has a similar story about how they've been made outsiders and have come to see themselves as such either because of their race, their lineage, their beliefs, or particular events. Sten, for example, uh, is a Kunari, a fictional race unique to the Dragon Age world, and he has a very different uh, outlook from the other characters. As another companion, Alistair, points out, the Kunari sense of honor is a bit hard to grasp. From Sten's perspective, however, his concept of honor is entirely reasonable while individualistic ideas such as self-determination are strange and irrational. As he says, what I do is for my people, always. I have been trained to choose as they would. What makes Stan other is thus also in urban society, he doesn't always agree with their rules. He complains that they train you to kill, teach you to harness your rage at the first noise you hear, then try to set a hundred Saudi rules about it. Alistair and Logain both seem to share a more rigid deontological perspective. But while Logain will go to any lengths to protect his country, Alistair believes his betrayal of the Grey Wardens is unforgivable, regardless of what those motives were. While the Warden must eventually side with one or the other, engaging in dialogue with Logain and his supporters, as well as with Alistair, permits the player to see both sides of the argument and raises numerous questions, including whether or not the, the ends justify the means. 
Answering this question is not simply a matter of choosing right from wrong, but of defining how and under what conditions each character, including the warden, distinguishes between the two. While in some cases it's possible to group in-game choices into good and evil, the companions foreground the multiplicity of ways in which those actions can be justified as right or wrong. Holquist notes that, quote, Bakhtin insists on differences that cannot be overcome. Separateness and simultaneity are basic conditions of existence. It's perhaps worth comparing the simplified and homogenized worldview that guides the warden's quest to defeat the Darkspawn Horde with the companion's varied beliefs, which can't be reduced to a common denominator. We should also keep in mind that while classifying these beliefs based on moral theories may be useful for drawing out the differences between companions, it's just as important to note the internal inconsistencies and contradictions. While treating characters, both heroes and villains, as free people with individual consciousnesses is, I believe, one way in which video games can develop as an art, game developers aren't alone in creating the game experience. As several people here have noted, the game as an ethical object or as an artifact, uh, well, sorry, as an experience, I suppose I should say at this point, <laughs> can only be, be apprehended through play or through gaming. See, I've, I have to change this like 10 times now. It's terrible. <laughs> um, which is always shaped in part by the player. If players can also learn to perceive the coexistence and interaction of multiple worlds within a game, they may come to interpret a game differently, to demand or imagine different sorts of games, and to co-author their own characters in new ways. Certainly, there's a great deal more to Bakhtin's notions of polyphony and the dialogical self, um, process of identif identification, the game, than what I've been able to lay out here. But hopefully, uh, what I'm sort of trying to get across here is at least a new direction or area of focus, um, if not a precisely laid out path. Dragon Age Origins, I would hope, is only the beginning. There we go. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Carolyn, for that uh, crash course in ethics. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, is there... Okay, there's one hand up immediately. Okay. Thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm finding myself wondering um, about where you think the ethical significance of all this is. Because on the one hand, I can see, okay, we've got some ethical perspectives expressed by characters within the game. Um, but does the player, the warden, actually really have any meaningful choices to make? Because you couldn't, for example, choose not to fight the Horde, because where does the game go then? Right? There's, there's something you know, predetermined about the choices that the warden has to make. So while I can see that if we have characters portrayed who, um, if you like, have a sort of a position Right, an ethical position. Okay, we can derive something about the meta-ethics from what people say. Um, unless the player has some meaningful ethical choices to make, does it really matter? That's a great question, um, and that's actually one of my frustrations with Dragon Age, is that there are limited ways in which you can express an ethical perspective, because yeah, I think it's actually very constricted in that sense, especially in terms of having this final mission that you absolutely have to complete to finish the game. Um, definitely. Uh, I think where it gets interesting for me and what I, why I'm focusing, I guess, on the companions and I wish I could have spent more time with it, but the approval rating system um, is that the companions themselves actually change how they relate to the player's character based on how that character is acting. And that is where the more interesting the ethical side of things kind of plays out. Um, so, and this might be specific to this game. I mean, I, there may be other examples out there, but in the way that this game is constructed, I think that that relationship between the two is, from an ethical perspective, the most interesting. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, hi. Thanks. I agree with you with the idea that you hope that Dragon Age is only the beginning, but at the same time, I don't see it multi multiplicity where you see it. I mean, for me, uh, the example of Dragon Age is 
a link of continuous dualities. I mean, every problem has dual, dual, dual solutions. And with this duality, an, an idea or, or an illusion of multiplicity is created. And that's for me, mm. it's, a, it's a dangerous thing to do. I mean, to camouflage, to, he, to hide a multi, multiplicity with where there's only duality, where there are only, I oh don't know, you could say normative way, ways of understanding ethics, of understanding the world, of, under, of understanding yourself. Mm -hmm. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree. I kind of, I've gone with Dragon Age because, I, well, for one thing, it's what I'm writing my thesis on. So <laughs> um, it's, it relates to my research in that way. Um, I, what I'm kind of trying to get at here to some extent is maybe the hope for p more potential. I think this is an area that could really be developed further. Um, if you go outside normative ethics, if you you know, just think of new perspectives that people could have. And I think it is kind of limited in that way. Um, what I find interesting, I guess, about the different uh, normative ethical perspectives or theories is the ways in which there are kind of contradictions that you can't quite get over. Um, so that, you know, one person will say, I'm right, and the other person will say, I'm right. And there's just no way that the two of them can ever see eye to eye. So I guess I'm trying to draw that out as something that could really be pushed um, because I think that's what makes these conversations really interesting, is when that happens. Uh, did that answer? <laughs> yeah, it's more a conversation. I mean, my comment was not a question, so uh, yeah, yeah, of course. It, just, okay. it was a very nice response, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I was just wondering um, if you played Dragon Age 2, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, most of it, <laughs> working on it. If you could comment on, you know, kind of the changes to the system there, because obviously uh, Bioware changed, you know, the approval, so now you have kind of the, I, I forget what they call it, but... Friendship and rivalry. Rivalry, right. So that yeah. you're not sort of, if you want to game, the, you don't have to game the game to get everybody on your side, you know, so you don't lose anybody. You can still disagree with people, um, you know, and that can actually be a benefit in, in certain ways. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, for me, Dragon Age 2, I find disappointing because, maybe partly just because of my own... Um, set of preferences. <laughs> uh, it seems kind of really rushed um, to me. And yeah, that, the rivalry friendship thing is kind of interesting because for me, I mean, the gaming the system maybe is, I think it's something that's definitely out there and that needs to be acknowledged. Um, I would like to actually see that kind of worked against maybe just as an experiment um, to see what happens when you can't do it. But I think reducing everybody's relationship, or just taking it away entirely, taking that investment away um, in what the character thinks of you, uh, it maybe isn't the way to do it. Um, rather, I think removing the, these sort of things I was talking about, like maybe saving mechanisms or um, uh, gift giving, um, so that it's not quite as easy to game the system might be a better way of going about it. Um, but yeah, for me, I find that, like I don't relate to the characters in Dragon Age 2 in nearly the same way that I do in the first game. Okay, uh, we, we could even manage one, one more question. Is there anybody else? Okay, last one. And then we take a 10 minute break so the, uh, the other person can set up their stuff and uh, that we have two, two talks after the break. Okay. Well, I, th I think this, this maybe just reiterates what's just been said. It's just that I find this very interesting, this thing about, because I think it's also in Bioshock and a lot of other games that try to be setting up ethical problems inside the game world, so to speak, but they mm -hmm. sort of muddle that with strategic benefits, which is what you said, basically, that you have to game the game system in order to get at what you want from the fiction and vice versa, and I think that that always gets me as bad design, basically, but maybe that's just me. I'm just wondering whether you would agree with me that that actually sort of makes it not very ethical at all. Because, I mean, it, you somehow have two things to juggle. That I want to agree with this genocide because I'm a bastard, but then I'm going to be penalized because they're going to take away my sword. <laughs> So, so you got, you got two, two kinds of ethics. So Miguel should be here, but um, I mean, just... Yeah. I wonder if you could comment a little bit more on that. What's your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree completely that, um, yeah, you end up with, well, I mean, sorry, <laughs> um, <laughs> that you end up, yeah, with those two agendas, essentially, and, and you generally, like, it just seems, and I got, obviously, this depends on the player, but at least for me, I always end up going towards the strategy side of things in the end, um, and I think it was the Project Horseshoe Report, um, to be honest, it's a big list of authors, I can't remember them right now, but the 2009 Project Horseshoe Report talks about this um, in Bioshock in particular, of having an option essentially of choosing right from right, so that, um, I mean, that isn't really a good way of going either, because then what you end out with is, well, you know, if I do it this way, um, I get a reward. If I do it this way, I also get a reward, yeah, just yeah, slightly just differently. Yeah, it's a different reward, yeah. <laughs> um, but but I, I'm kind of wondering whether, I'm looking forward to reading some more of this, basically sort of how to set up these genuinely ethical dilemmas in, in first person or single player games. I guess this turns around completely if other real people are involved, but this thing about maybe you know, divorcing or uncoupling these two systems in ways that are just outlined with this Dragon Age 2, that that may make for not a better experience, but a different one. A different one, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the nice thing about Dragon Age is that it does use this, these multiple scales as opposed to the one, you know, I'm evil, I'm good, or I'm, you know. <laughs> so it goes a long ways in that way. And I like the fact that it, it's you're almost relating to the ethics of the other person more than your own, or that is what's forming your own, um, because those opinions do matter to you. But yeah, as soon as you then say, oh, well, I can make them all happy with me, regardless of what I do, it, it really takes away, I think, um, from that, that value. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Carolyn. Very much.